The machine was unassuming in construction, even smaller than I had imagined it would be when I had seen the prototype online. The reviews had been stellar, and all of the time tourists that had used it seemed enthusiastic to try it in other spheres of their lives where they had left less than satisfying memories. I was sure my life would change when I flicked the switch on. Still, my heart did not stop beating as frazzled nerves exerted itself all over my body. I dropped the coffee mug I held onto the table as gently as I could. Shit, I cussed nonchalantly, assessing the gray appliance with a fleeting glance just once. Then I flicked the switch, damning all consequences. The machine revved to a light, igniting an illuminating white glow that grew larger from the middle to form a portal. The temptation was instantaneous, and my skin tingled in disbelief. It was real. It was working. I thought to myself as I took one step forward. The buzzing glow of light drew me in with such warmth that affected my senses. It was bliss, pure ecstasy if I had ever felt it. In one moment it felt like a cocoon of warmth, and in a split second it sucked me in with the harshness of glass shards piercing through my skin. I cried loudly, bent over with my hands over my ears, and my eyes shut to manage the pain. Suddenly, the pain stopped. My beating heart animated me of my immediate consciousness, and when I opened my eyes, I was in that familiar pink room with all of my things just the way I recalled them to be. The walls were pink and the bed was neatly arranged. My life-size teddy was on the bed, just how I always placed it. What? I blurted in puzzlement. My stomach growled. I turned around to face the mirror on the wall, and there my image was, being myself again, and sixteen years old. It pinched my face, and it hurt. Ow, honey. My mother's voice, tender and smooth, came muffled through the door. The hinge moved and the door was open. My stomach sank when I saw my mother for the first time in what was an uncountable eternity. The confusion in my mother's eyes made me stiffen up, sniffling back on the tears in my eyes and the stinging snort in my nostrils. Did you hurt yourself, baby? My mom asked. No. I paused, and my voice broke in surrender. No, mom. Oh, Claire, you don't have to come with us if you don't want to. My mom followed up on the worried look on my face. Your dad and I will be back before nightfall. I nodded my head. Realization hit me like a train to the midsection. In a lifetime, I was familiar with, I had gone with my parents, and we had been attacked by a gun-wielding psychopath. I had escaped with my life, but the killer, Jonas Cornell, had butchered both my parents. I had been able to testify in his conviction, but that was a different lifetime. The horrors of reminiscing hurt my stomach, and I threw my body on the bed. Before I could turn around, my mom let out a sigh to leave me alone until it was pulled shut. From where I lay on the bed, I heard both my parents converse briefly before the car started up. The engine got louder as they left in a weird twist of reality, until the crude noise drowned my senses. I shut my eyes briefly to stop the noise from the engine and the tears from my eyes. When I opened them, I was back in my room with the time machine in front of me, but everything else was different. The smell of rotten food wafted to my nostrils, and it gagged me violently. On the table where I recalled I had dropped my coffee, a moldy slice of pizza was falling off. A bottle of vodka, half drunk, also occupied the table. I scowled in horror. What the F? I blanched, and my breath smelled like alcohol. My entire body numbed, and it was because of all things, I never drank alcohol. No, no, no. I jumped at the machine as a time tourist for another round of experience with tears in my eyes. My second board went by quickly, and just as I expected, I was in the room again. I rushed to the mirror, following the routine unwittingly, and I pinched my face. Oh, I cried. Honey, my mother, almost in the same manner she had appeared those times, was back. Did you hurt yourself, baby? My eyes turned steely. I turned to her. You don't have to go, Mom. You and Dad. You don't have to go anywhere today. I wheezed, desperately rushing over to her and pulling her to the bed. She followed under my compelling pull to the bed. 
You don't have to come with us if you. I don't have to go. Neither you nor dad have to go, I said, observing how my mom searched my eyes for any strange effects. I don't do stuff or alcohol or smoke, mom. My father appeared from the door and poked his head through. He asked what was holding both of his favorite ladies up. My mom sighed and said I was acting strange. I grinned with relief when she took my side and mentioned the need to cancel. It's the game of the season, Margaret. Come on, you both. He slammed the door before he finished his statement and started into a rant. My mom tapped her hand on my shoulder and asked for a moment to speak to him. She left, but the noise only grew louder and louder until I could not contain it. I shut my eyes and opened them, and I was back in my room with a mysterious old lady cussing at me aggressively. Pure dread attacked her body as I watched the toothless mouth spew venom at her from the couch. The face was undeniably my mother's, but the bile was unrecognizable. She said I had let my father die, and I was horrible. She was angry, angry that was intense enough that it made her old face red with heat. No, no, no. I hollered as my thumping heart racked my ribcage. I took another chance with the time machine, realizing there was only one way to live with my tragedy, and it was to accept my full story for what it was. I stepped into the time machine, and I was back in the room, rounding back to the mirror and pinching my face. I yelled, and my mother appeared, watched the entire motion from my own body like a spectator. And the truth of the time machine struck me. It was not designed to change the past, as any change had its effect on the present. Either way was more miserable than the other. At least I had lived a more familiar one. The horror of knowing my parents would die on the way to the game at the exact time it would happen, and the horrible villain who would kill them made me cry. But I relieved myself of the burden of choice and simply enjoyed my mother's warmth for the last time and my father's strength when he took a bullet to the stomach to give me enough room to escape the killer's muzzle. I broke the loop when I allowed things to be, and I was back to my room with the coffee on the table. My horrors finally ceased. The house was the last one on the street, advertised at the local estate agent as a well-loved property in need of some general maintenance, it had immediately piqued my interest. The area wasn't well known to me, but it seemed quiet and away from the main thoroughfare into town. The kind of place that troublemakers wouldn't bother, which is what I was in need of as a single mother. The price was just within my budget too, and it only took one viewing for me to decide to take it. My son seemed to like it too, which was a bonus. The first week was a blur of packing and unpacking, replacing the dingy yellow walls of our old apartment with the floral pink wallpaper of the new house. It was clear nobody had lived there in a while since the place was rife with dust and mildew, like the windows hadn't been opened in over a year, leaving everything to settle in the crevices. Some pieces of furniture had been left behind, a couple of chairs, an old dining table, and a moth-eaten sofa that went straight into a skip. Upstairs, the wooden bed frames had been abandoned, along with a scuffed dresser and wardrobe, but everything else was missing. The hard floors didn't even have a rug, and several dark stains tarnished the wooden places. About a week after moving into the new house, it started to resemble something more of a home. I managed to grab some furniture from local yard sales and thrift shops, and the empty, desolate rooms were soon populated by pops of color. I even let my son Henry choose out some things for his room, since we were no longer confined by the limited space of our old apartment. Everything went smoothly that first week. Henry and I gradually settled into the routine of our new surroundings, and I started to feel like we finally had a place we felt safe, somewhere we could stay for a while, growing into our environment. I never had a place to call home, and I thought that this might be it. But I was wrong. It was the second Tuesday we'd spent living in that house. Henry was at school, and I was doing some cleaning, trying to scrub out the old stains in the kitchen. After spending an hour inhaling bleach and scraping the sink clean, I headed upstairs for a short break. There was some laundry to put away, so I was between rooms when I heard it. 
some sort of soft hissing sound coming from above me. At first, I paused, laundry basket hoisted in my arm, listening carefully. I thought maybe it was the wind or something else from outside, but it was coming from directly above me. I lifted my gaze to the small hatch in the ceiling. The attic had been detailed in the plans of the house, but I had yet to go up there. I had figured it wasn't much of a priority when I had the rest of the house to sort out first, so I hadn't bothered to investigate. Was that where the sounds were coming from? I set the laundry basket down and stretched up onto my tiptoes, trying to get a better idea of what I was hearing, but it was too faint to get a proper grasp on it. If there was something up there that I needed to know about, there was no point in delaying any longer. I didn't have any means of getting up there without a ladder, which I didn't currently possess, so I hurried around to my neighbors to see if I could borrow one. Armed with a rusty stepladder, I set it up below the hatch and began to climb, listening to that strange undulating hiss noise coming from above. I undid the latch and pushed open the attic door, immediately choking on the dust that was billowing down. Once the air had cleared, I poked my head through the gap, brushing aside a stray cobweb. The attic wasn't thrown into pitch darkness as I expected. A faint grainy light sweeped across the floorboards, illuminating the dust in the air. The gray light was coming from somewhere further in. Swallowing back my apprehension, I hoisted myself up through the hatch and scrambled onto the floor of the attic, finally picking myself up. I dug my phone out of my pocket and switched on the torch function, shining it across my feet. A couple of insects skittered and dispersed into the corners of the room, but I ignored them. Bugs were one thing I wasn't scared of, thanks to growing up with several older brothers. The attic was empty for the most part, except for a couple of old cardboard boxes and black trash bags. What drew my attention, however, was the thing at the very back of the attic. The thing that was emitting that faint grainy light. It was a television, an old boxy thing with a VCR slot like something from the 90s. The screen was filled with fuzzy gray static, the reason for the light and the hissing sound I'd heard from before. I walked closer to the TV, frowning. Why was it turned on? I shone my torch over the walls, but I couldn't see a power plug anywhere. How was it managing to power itself without electricity? The cord slithered loosely across the floorboard, disconnected. Surely it was impossible for a TV like this to work without power. It was all rather bizarre, but there was no point dwelling on something you couldn't explain. I reached for the power button and turned it off. The attic went deathly silent, my torchlight dimming. A faint chill ran over my arms and neck, bringing goosebumps to the surface. Not sure where the feeling was coming from, I did my best to swallow back the dread and cross the attic back to the ladder. I had barely put my foot on the first rung when the TV switched itself back on. The sudden burst of static made me jump, eliciting a soft yell from my lips. I threw back my head and glanced toward the television on the other side of the room. Static once more filled the screen, wavy gray lines that made my eyes water the more I looked at it. I stood frozen, one foot on the ladder, staring into the gloom at the TV. Did it have some kind of faulty wiring? Did that even make sense? What other explanation was there? Because I certainly didn't believe in anything of a paranormal nature. Technology could be unpredictable, even the old stuff. There had to be some kind of reason that I was simply unaware of. Ignoring the slight tremor in my hand, I crossed the attic once more and jabbed the off button, plunging the screen into darkness. I waited a second, then another. When I was certain it wouldn't turn back on, I turned around. This time, what I heard from the television wasn't static. It was a voice, a whisper soft as the wind. The chill from before returned, making me feel cold all over. A flutter of unease made my heart beat faster. Could I have imagined it? I wanted to say yes, but when I turned back around, the TV was on again. The whisper had gone, replaced once more by static, but I couldn't get the sound of it out of my head. I stared at the undulating gray sea on the screen until my eyes began to glimpse something through the chaos, a shape hidden beneath the reams of pixels. It took me a second to realize what I was seeing. 
a face or something that resembled a face. I glimpsed two dark eyes, a long jaw, sunken cheeks. I blinked, wishing for the image to disappear, but it was still there, a face amongst the static. With a sharp gasp, I hit the switch again, vanishing the face from my view. Instead, my own distorted, terrified gaze teared back through the reflection on the screen. Whatever was wrong with this TV, it wasn't normal. I didn't have an explanation, but it wasn't simply some electrical fault. It was something else. In the end, I decided to just throw the TV out. I didn't know if it could be fixed or if it was worth anything, but I knew that I had to get rid of it. Whatever had happened in this house, with this television, I had no part of it, nor would I involve myself or my son any further. My wife Trisha was the CEO of a small but growing tech company. I was just a teacher. We had a very happy marriage, and it didn't bother me that Trisha was the breadwinner of the house. She was always stressed out though, and she put a lot of pressure on herself to keep expanding her company. Last quarter, her company had their biggest profits yet. They just acquired another small company, which was a difficult but very lucrative deal for them. At her shareholders meeting, Trisha was able to give the good news to her investors. Afterward, she came home in very good spirits, so I decided to take her out to dinner to celebrate. Even though I didn't like fancy restaurants, I knew that Trisha did. So I ended up taking her to a French restaurant that I heard great things about. We sat at a table in the back and ordered. Before the food came, Trisha told me all about her day. She really was an amazing woman, and I was so happy that her was doing well. Throughout the meal, though, I noticed that one of the waiters kept staring at us from the other side of the restaurant. I didn't say anything at first, but after a while, it started to creep me out. I interrupted Trisha and told her to look to her left. By the time she glanced over, the waiter was already gone. I didn't think much about the waiter after that. We ended up having a really nice, pleasant dinner. I tried to pay, but Trisha wouldn't let me. We thanked our waiter and headed out. When we got into the parking lot, Trisha shouted, What the hell? I didn't know what she was looking at. She started running toward our car. That's when I saw what she'd seen. Our tires had been slashed. Right away, I thought about the waiter who had stared at us. I knew there was something strange about him. I didn't have proof, but I figured he was the one who slashed our tires. I explained that to Trisha, and she seemed pretty scared. She asked me to describe the man. I told her that he was balding and tall with a red goatee. Oh my God, she said. She knew this person. She didn't tell me who it was though. She just told me to call a tow truck. Shouldn't I call 911 first? I asked. No, she screamed. I tried to get her to explain who this guy was, but she wouldn't. Eventually, the tow truck came and replaced our tires. Then we went back home. Trisha and I had just moved into a new house. She bought it right after her company made its big acquisition. It was a lot nicer and bigger than we needed, especially because we weren't planning to have kids, but it was a great place, very secluded. When we got inside, Trisha locked the door. I could tell she was still freaked out about the vandalism, but she still wouldn't tell me what was going on. We ended up going to sleep early. I had nightmares the whole night. The next day, Trisha went to our office as usual. I stayed at home. My students were on spring break. I did my regular house chores, still thinking about that man with the red goatee. I went out to grab the mail, but when I opened our mailbox, there was a dead bird inside. It had a pocket knife sticking out of its stomach. Someone had put it there. I went back inside and called Trisha. When I told her what I'd seen, she got really quiet on the phone. Then I begged her to tell me who was after her. She took a deep breath and finally explained everything. She said that the company they'd acquired last quarter didn't want to sell. It was a hostile takeover, and the man was one of its owners. He hated losing his company. And now, he was after her. I felt terrible. All Trisha wanted to do was grow her company. She was the hardest worker I knew, 
and it wasn't fair that stupid business stuff would lead to stalking and harassment. Still, I had to be prepared in case he came back. I told Trisha that I was going to call the police, and once again, she screamed, No. I could tell there was something she wasn't telling me, but I trusted her enough not to argue. I ended the call and then walked around the house, making sure all the doors and windows were locked. Nothing happened for the next few days. Trisha and I didn't even talk about it. We just pretended that life was back to normal. Then Friday came around. Trisha was at her office as usual, and I'd just gotten home from the farmer's market. I walked inside and unloaded all my groceries. I put everything in the fridge, not really paying attention to what I was doing. But when I closed the fridge, I saw that someone had defaced all our photos. Trisha's face was scratched off each one. Somehow, the stalker had gotten inside the house. I ran to the table where I'd left my phone, but before I could reach it, the bearded man jumped out of a closet and grabbed me. He had the craziest look in his eyes. Please, I said, too scared to fight back. Don't hurt me. He shoved me hard. I fell backwards, slamming into the kitchen island, and then collapsing onto the ground. As I tried to stand, the man kicked me in the face. I felt one of my teeth loosen. I looked up, blood oozing from my mouth, and I saw the man loom over me. He pulled out a knife. What do you want? I whimpered. Blood, he said. You and your wife are monsters. We didn't do anything. Really? He roared. He explained that he and his brother had started that company ten years ago. Trisha tried to buy it off them, but they refused. Their business was very successful, and they loved what they did. So Trisha sabotaged some of their products, paid people to intimidate their staff, and slandered them online. She created so much drama that the men were forced to sell their company for peanuts. She wouldn't do that. They protested. I knew my wife. She was a good person, but I'm not done. He screamed, keeping the knife close enough to my face that I was scared to move. After she took our company and swindled us out of millions, she bribed the government to foreclose on my brother's house. And then she bought it. He was talking about the house we were in right now. My brother had a heart attack soon after. He continued, All the stress that your wife gave him was just too much, and when I saw you in the restaurant, laughing and eating a $300 meal, I knew I had to do something. His expression was unhinged, but somehow I believed him. Trisha was an amazing wife, but I guess she was a monster at work. All our success was built on the terrible things she did. That would explain why she never wanted me to call the police. He raised the knife, ready to strike. Any last words? He said, I'm sorry. I said. Instantly, his grip on the knife loosened. He could see in my eyes that I had nothing to do with the tragedies in his life. It was all Trisha. He reached down. For a second, I thought he was going to strangle me. But instead, he grabbed my arm and helped me stand. My mouth was throbbing, but I was no longer dripping in blood. Will you help me? He asked. With what? Revenge. I thought about it for a long time. I could never do anything to hurt Trisha. But if everything this man said was true, then she needed to pay for what she did. No. I said, I won't help you. But I won't get in your way either. He smiled at my answer. Then he turned around and walked out of the house. After that, I went to the dentist for emergency surgery. It wasn't that bad. And when I got home, I waited for Trisha to arrive. I was going to tell her everything, including my deal with her stalker. She never came home. The police found her car in the office basement, but Trisha was never seen again. Her company went on without her. I ended up selling the house and moved into a smaller, cheaper place. I didn't know what happened to that bearded man, but I hope he stays away from me forever.